Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to my talk, You've Got Pwned, Exploiting Email Systems. Uh, my name is Inti de Keukelaire. I'll do a quick introduction of myself. Uh, I come from this beautiful country in Europe called Belgium, uh, so excuse me for the accent. I currently work as a community manager at bug bounty platform Integrity, um, where I basically get to tweet on their Twitter account and, and be the voice of the hacker community. Uh, I, I really love live hacking events. Uh, I've participated in quite a few of them, mostly organized by HackerOne, so I, I definitely have some experience with that. And even in, in 2018, uh, I was uh, lucky enough to win uh, their, their, their flagship event in Vegas, basically, H1702, where I walked away with, with the Most Valuable Hacker uh, Award, so that was kind of nice. Uh, but in all my research, and even at these live hacking events, one thing that always comes back are, are emails. And I have made a fair amount of, of bug bounty uh, exploiting or, or finding uh, bugs in email systems or emails themselves. And I hope to share some of this information with you today. So first, I'll uh, go on and explain why exactly I, I do like emails that much. Uh, first of all, emails just contain a whole bunch of confidential information. And if you don't believe me, I challenge you to just uh, go to your inbox and, and open a, a few uh, links that or emails that still make it to your inbox and not get filtered by the spam filter. Usually, you know, we send and receive quite a, quite a lot of confidential information. Nobody likes their emails being breached. So it's always a very interesting target for hackers. Also, they contain certain links that allow hackers to break into systems such as password reset links and emails have been around for quite a while and and people just use it for all different purposes you have ticket trackers you have you, you know people just integrated with it within their system so it's it's kind of complex for such a simple thing which is just basically the essence of it is just delivering messages or attachments or files uh, but there's there's a lot of of edge cases and implementation mistakes. So that's why I really like it. It's also pretty old standard. And over the past few years, uh, the standard has changed a little bit and we, we made it uh, a little bit more secure. But yeah, it's, it's, it's still uh, very interesting to study for, for, for vulnerabilities. And, and also every, every app uses it. Uh, name a web app that, don't use, that doesn't use emails today. I mean, that's, that's nearly impossible. Um, so that, that's why I uh, use it as my main target when participating in bug bounty programs. So uh, let's take a look at what we'll cover today. First, we'll talk about email addresses themselves. Um, and then we'll go into the email itself. So basically the, the email that you send out. And then we'll discuss, okay, what can go wrong in in all around that, which basically is, uh, for example, spam systems, autoresponders, and all the systems and and behaviors really of of how emails interact with with systems will be covered in that last topic. Uh, but let's take it one step at a time and and take a look at email addresses first. Um, for this particular uh, part, we're going to see what kind of interesting payloads and valid email addresses uh, can contain. And then we'll also see, okay, how does, how, how does the, the web application, how do they react to these payloads and how can we get our, our interesting payloads into these web applications, even though they don't support it right away. So first part, payload crafting. So this is a very uh, normal you, you know, representation of an email address. Uh, I mean, that's kind of obvious. You have a local part, you have the ad symbol, and then you have the domain. But email addresses are much, much more than that. Uh, if you would look at the specification, of course, they can just contain Latin letters. They can contain digits, uh, dots, but no uh, two dots after each other. Uh, they don't like that, so it's, it's prohibited. <laughs> Uh, but I don't think many of you know that you can, for example, have an exclamation part uh, mark or like an, an, an ampersand, for example, in an email address. 
which is perfectly valid. And, and most web applications that use a decent validator will actually accept that. And also for, for international purposes, there's, there's more and more support for the more exotic looking email addresses, which also, I mean, uh, brings a couple of problems with it, like um, homograph attacks, but we won't cover that in this uh, talk. So what's interesting and, and something I, I found uh, a couple of years ago and I didn't know it existed was that if you quote email addresses, so basically put the local part between double quotes, you can even add some more characters. And uh, the most interesting part is that you can also add, for example, uh, a less than sign of a greater than sign, which can be used to inject HTML. So every uh, email address that you see currently, uh, even that with the double add are actually completely valid email addresses. You can even have a space in them and even an emoji. I mean, it's just, it's just a valid email address if it's quoted and not a lot of people are aware of this. Um, then there's also um, the fact that I'm sure quite a lot of you use the basic version, which is basically uh, for Gmail, for example, you have to append a, a plus sign and then you can uh, write some gibberish uh, are the, the wildcards and the comments. For example, if you just say, OK, uh, I want I have the, a spam email address, for example, and I, I filter out everything, but I still want it to come into my inbox. You can just add something and then the final result will still be delivered to you, but you'll be able to filter things out based off uh, of this wildcard. And then there's another standard and I've never ever seen this used in a real life scenario, but it's still in the in the in the RFC. Uh, you can include comments between uh, parentheses. So, um, um, you know, just like JavaScript and HTML, you can even have a comment in, in an email address, uh, email parsers or email uh, processors will just end up ignoring it. So the email will still get through. Uh, but that's also a quite a interesting uh, factor we'll, we'll play with today. Um, and then there's the domain part, um, which is a little bit more strict. Um, obviously, we also have the Latin letters, we have the digits, uh, hyphens. Uh, but what's really interesting here is that you can have IP addresses. Uh, I've never seen a successful email address to an IP address. Uh, I would have to look into the standard, but definitely for very specific vulnerabilities. If this is a valid email address, I mean, we can have some, you know, we can create some interesting SSRF payloads with that. Um, so that's why I, I've included those. Okay, so let's, let's start crafting with the information that we have now. Um, and the orange is, is basically, it's not entirely valid according to, to the RFC as, as these uh, characters would have to be double quoted. So, so like here, but still I found during my research that uh, quite a lot of email address parsers would actually accept it. Uh, so that's why I mentioned it. Uh, for example, this email address, just test and then uh, the wildcard and then the parentheses to indicate a comment and then just a cross-site scripting payload. There's a lot of websites that would actually think this is a valid email address and probably have you uh, confirm it and display it in their application. Problem is if they don't expect an XSS payload in an email address, which is something that developers generally don't expect uh, and they they don't properly sanitize it, then it will result in cross-site scripting. I've seen this happening quite a lot of public and, and very big uh, HackerOne programs. So it's definitely a thing not a lot of people are aware of. Um, and uh, this would be the, the entirely va valid uh, version according to the RFC. However, uh, I, I've seen this working more than this part. So it's, it's, it really comes down to the, to the local implementation or the interpretation uh, of the RFC. Uh, by the way, you can also put these things in the domain part because you can have comments in the domain part and then it will just ignore it and send it to your email address anyways. Um, now we're using scripts, which is ideal for testing um, 
cross-site scripting, for example, within an application, uh, but I would always recommend you to try HTML injection. For example, I sent uh, an email from this email address uh, or to this email address and uh, the email would uh, actually use the H1 tag and render it. So obviously just normal emails like who you would receive in Gmail, they won't be able to execute a script tag, but you may uh, have an HTML injection. So don't only test for script tags, only just uh, test for, for generic HTML tags as well. Uh, of course, there's also template injection, uh, you know, a lot of email addresses and you'll, you'll have to check in your own inbox, uh, either above or below. And this could be of some, because of some privacy or tracking reason, they will actually include the email address you've, you've, uh, they've sent it to. And if that contains a payload and they didn't properly execute it, it can, uh, it can uh, result in cross-site scripting or template injection. And usually it's like a sentence, this email was sent to blah, blah, blah. It's usually in very small letters, but always make sure to check that because if you can get a payload in that, that would be interesting. Uh, these are some example payloads that are, uh, that would also be valid. Um, and uh, for example, uh, if in case of a successful template action, you would see something like this, uh, which obviously, obviously just rendered or, or executed uh, this one. So, uh, Talking about that, and this this is a while ago, but I think it's still a quite a funny story. I I signed up for Hacker One with with the following email address, um, and nothing happens. So basically, it was just sitting there in my account, and I received all emails uh, using this. But, it, but it's since it's using a wildcard, it would just uh, come through. So I didn't really feel the need to change it after testing it, and then. Uh, like months after I injected it, I got an email from Mikhail uh, from HackerOne, uh, the founder, one of the founders. And it was actually sent to inti.de.cuclair uh, and then plus sign 49 at gmail.com. So I was like panicking and I was like, yeah, finally my, my payload got executed. I, I, I was very excited and I thought, okay, I have something in a hacker one system rendering my, my my template payload so i was i was writing up my report but then it turned out he was just probably looking to the rec records and sending some manual emails and was he was just trolling me so so michiel if you're watching this this still hurts uh, so all michiel what did was just uh, replace my email address and put a 49 it would just it would still come true and I would think I had a valid bug in Hacker One, but unfortunately, it was just a joke by MQ. Um, there's also SQL injection, obviously, uh, and this using this technique would actually also uncover some some tech some SQL injections that using normal black box testing just by putting some gibberish in the email or just by putting a non-valid email address containing a, a SQL injection payload in the email address. Um, it, it, it wouldn't be discovered uh, because most of the times what happens is they check whether the email is valid first and then they execute a query. Uh, and then, I mean, it's MD, MD5, that's it's just an example, by the way. It's, but in the password here, it wouldn't be vulnerable because it, it gets hashed. But the email would be, uh, as you can see, you can just break out of the query and, and, and add something yourself. But in order to do that, the email would have to be valid. So if you would set the email address to this, for example, which is a valid email address and still valid for the SQL query, then it would look like oh, there's like like that. Uh, yeah, okay. So like that, and obviously that's a valid injected query and you would be able to set the password of another email address using uh, this trick. So that's always uh, very interesting. Um, and then there's also, I talked about this earlier, but then there's also uh, SSRF. Um, so you can, in order to test this, for example, you can register with the burp collaborator email address and then look for a HTTP re request. Obviously not for a SMTP request because that's normal. Uh, but if there's an HTTP request, and usually this happens because the application try, tries to check whether the host is up, for example. Um, 
it, it can result, uh, basically it's, it's blind as a ref. So then you can check whether you can redirect it or make it call internal resources, for example. Uh, so, I mean, every nearly every website has a register module and they will somehow try to contact or send an email to the email address you signed up with. So it's definitely always uh, something I check at least. And then, and I have to admit, I haven't uh, really encountered this uh, a lot in the in the past but sometimes when you sign up and it does this this check to see whether it exists or not and you use uh, an internal IP you'll get an error but when the uh, internal IP does not exist and you you won't get an error if it does exist but then again it's it's a very rare case and then there's also uh, an and I think this is a, quite a, an underrated vulnerability, uh, especially when it comes to the server side. It's, it's uh, parameter pollution. So basically you would include another parameter in your email address, and this is a perfectly valid email address. Um, and what would happen if, is, is if there's, they're using a proxy or they're, they're making a second request on the backend and they just include your email address somewhere in a, in another server site request then your email may may end up being replaced by by this one so the email parameter basically gets overwritten and if you're lucky the the actual app that will process it will take the second value instead of the whole or or the first value uh, so you would be able for example to retrieve data from from somebody else in this example if they would query the email uh, the, the data by email address uh, it's it's really hard to find and obviously it's it's a lot easier to encounter during white box assessments but it's definitely something you should be in the lookout for then there's also http or smtp header reaction uh, also it it quite like it 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 depends uh, i i haven't seen this a lot i know albinobox has done some research on it uh, but basically this this also happens if you try to register with something and then it, it connects to or it, it connects to some SMTP interface and, and you'll be able to inject some uh, some additional comments or additional uh, statements in the in the command by by just using a new line uh, and then it, it gets executed. I gotta say I haven't encountered this myself in the past, but since it's a valid payload, you should be looking out for it. Um, so this this kind of uh, sums it up. Uh, these are the I'm I'm sure there there's more uh, valid payloads. So if uh, if you if you spot some some other uh, email addresses that would also be valid payload for uh, for traditional techni testing techniques, make sure to put them in the comments below. I would say, um, and then uh, another and this is more business logic, but another. Uh, way I've seen this being abused is by using domain whitelists. And I put Slack as an example here. I gotta say that um, Slack was not actually vulnerable, but I know it's if there's one domain or company domain validator, most of you would know it's actually this one. So I'm referring to this one. Uh, but uh, as you can see down here, it says, okay, if you have a, a Synac, Bookrout, Zeocopter, Integrity, Google, blah, 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 email address, you can just create an account. Um, and obviously people don't, that don't ha have it cannot join the, the Slack uh, workspace unless they're invited. So if you would sign up, you would get the drop down and it would look that like this. So in some cases, uh, I've seen this once, so I'm not sure if, if it's very common, uh, but in some cases, what you could do is you would enter this valid, perfectly valid email address and then if it accept, accepts it and passes it to whatever service is sending the email addresses, uh, it might see the semicolon and it will, you know, most of these services will see a semicolon as, okay, I have to split this, I have to send this to multiple people. So the first uh, email address or yeah, invalid email address, they would try to send it to is this one. And then this is my inbox. And then this is the third one they would try to send it to, which includes the company domain. So it makes it a valid company domain email address. But the final email gets delivered to my inbox, which obviously is not part of the company domain. Um, so 
like I said, Slack was not vulnerable to this. It's a theoretical example with at least uh, one occurrence of it being exploited in the wild. So it's, it's also something if you see a mechanism like this, make sure to test something like this. Um, and another very fun example of uh, possible exploitation in the wild is uh, you can send uh, to, to Gmail. If you have a Gmail address, you can just use the wildcard and send this string to your Gmail address and it will actually render. It will still work. Uh, obviously, it's not vulnerable to cross-site scripting, otherwise the Gmail team would have fixed it uh, right away. But it seems to be some weird uh, Gmail quirk. I'm not sure who uses it or why it's there, but I mean, if you want to try it out, it should still work if you're watching this video. Um, then I've obviously like Gmail was, I, for a second, I thought I had cross-site scripting there. It was not the case, but I tested some other email clients as well, and they were actually vulnerable. Uh, so I, obviously I cannot name them in this presentation. I didn't get disclosure permission, uh, but if you're ever are testing uh, an email client, also make sure to test whether they properly escape email addresses themselves. Okay, and then uh, email validators. So, okay, we have made all this creative and cool payloads, but we still have to insert them somewhere in, in, a, in an application. And most of them have a pretty strict email validator. And even if your uh, email is correct for the RFC, it may not be correct for the web application. So for example, with Facebook, you, you can simply sign up with this, uh, with a given error. Um, and I was testing GitLab, uh, they have a public HackerOne program um, and I also tried to insert my email address uh, with the cross-site scripting payload, so I signed up with this one and luckily the username was available but I couldn't sign up with the email address. Um, so I took a step back and then I saw, okay, but you can also actually sign up and register with one of these services. So if I can get this email address in one of these services, it would still end up in my GitLab email account. So that's so I made this uh, table of, of uh, all services that would actually accept my email address that contained uh, a cross-site scripting payload and was actually also valid according to the RFC. So these services did nothing wrong really. It was just GitLab that was not really prepared for it. Uh, and I tried to sign up. So basically this was the first uh, case I tried. I tried to si uh, sign up directly uh, to GitLab with this email address, didn't work. And then I tried to sign up uh, with GitHub. And then once I had the GitHub account linked to that email address, I would sign up uh, with GitLab for GitLab and it would actually contain my email address. So that's what I did here. Uh, as you can see, this is uh, me signing up uh, with GitLab and then signing up with uh, with GitHub and then signing up with GitLab. And then as, as you can see, my email address, uh, including the payload got added to my account. Uh, so this wouldn't have been possible through the normal re registration uh, form, but it was po uh, possible by abusing a single sign-on provider. Unfortunately, uh, GitLab, has their things together and there was no cross-site scripting issue here. So I had a cool email validation bypass, I would say, but I mean, that's not something you would report. So I started digging deeper and I uh, eventually made it to account takeover. Unfortunately, not on the main GitLab account, but uh, I'll dig in it, uh, into it right away. So while I was doing research, I also noticed that Salesforce would actually also allow people to use their single sign-on if you had not verified your email address. Um, they, it's documented and they assume that the, the vendor should probably, I mean, they have a parameter to check whether the email is validated or not. So it's not Salesforce's fault, uh, but the vendor should, should do an extra check to make sure that uh, <clears throat> the, the email address received is actually verified. It's not Salesforce's job to do that. It's, it's the, the third party that integrates with them. Um, so I basically tried the, the same trick and I, I, I was wondering what would happen if I would try to sign up with the email address of a victim that was signed up with GitLab. So this is linked to a valid GitLab account and then tried to, obviously I couldn't sign up with this again. It would just say, okay, this already exists. 
Uh, but then sign this email address up with Salesforce. I didn't have to confirm it. And then signing up with Salesforce. And if GitLab wouldn't do the extra check, I was thinking, okay, what would happen? Maybe it would result in account takeover. Maybe the system would crash. I'm not sure. So the only way to find out is to actually try it. And uh, Salesforce, as you can see, this is, uh, this is the response. And they clearly have this field that says, okay, email verified. And, and all would depend on the fact whether GitLab would actually check that or not. So it's an interesting edge case. And usually in the case of edge cases, uh, developers tend to forget those. So that's always interesting to search for security vulnerabilities. So as you can see, I just um, signed up for Salesforce with an email that I can possibly have, uh, gitlab.com email. Uh, and as you can see, I actually also went in the API and my email verified flag was set to false. So no fault on Salesforce's side here. But then I tried to sign up with it. And as you can see, the account got created. Um, it didn't work, however, to hijack existing accounts. What would happen if uh, would be that it would just create a duplicate account with the same email address. But then I noticed I was doing some, some Google dorking and some recon. Then I noticed they had this forum uh, that, that would allow people to log in with GitLab. So I was like, okay, if I can't take over GitLab accounts, maybe I can do the second best thing and take over integrations with GitLab, for example, the forum. Uh, with this button. So let's do a quick recap. Um, obviously, my victim example.org already, already existed in GitLab. I couldn't just sign up again and, and log into their account. That wouldn't work and would be a serious security vulnerability. But I could obviously sign up for it using uh, Salesforce and then I could uh, sign up with, with Salesforce for GitLab. And I would just have the same email address on a GitLab account, but it wouldn't be the same account. Those would be two different accounts with the same email address, but with a different ID. Um, so then I noticed that they have this, they had this discourse uh, forum linked, uh, and you could use login with GitLab. And the thing they would check was the email address. But since this uh, email address would equal this email address, for the integration, we would be the same person. So I could hijack and take over any um, any integrated service with GitLab, which is not as cool as main account takeover, but it was still a, a very nice vulnerability. Um, and and this is this is an actual demo of it. So I signed up with security at, security at wearehackerone.com, and then I also signed up with this, but uh, I didn't really confirm it. I was just playing playing the attacker that doesn't have access to this email address. Uh, and as you can see, this is just my Discourse forum account. Here is the my, my uh, avatar. And as you can see, this is the fake GitLab account, and it's basically just the same email address. And then if I would go to the forum, I would say, okay, I want to sign in with GitLab. I would say, yeah, just have my email address so you can check who I am. But obviously I just took an unverified Salesforce email address. And here you go. Uh, we were logged into the same account. And as you can see, the avatar is the same. So it's, it's the same account. Uh, and you could see, for example, the messengers or, or posts as that user. It, it obviously got resolved uh, as, as a critical. And I do have to thank uh, Ron Chen, by the way, because he initially found the way to bypass email validation through uh, Salesforce. But what he didn't find is the, the actual account takeover part. So the next step that I took, uh, where I would go and see if there's any integrations and take those over. So uh, in, in, in discussion with the GitLab team, we agreed to split the bounty, even though my book was technically a duplicate. Uh, we, we ended up splitting the bounty in the end, but they did raise it thanks to me. So it was a win-win for, for both of us. All right, so now we covered the email addresses. Let's take a look at the emails themselves. Um, emails usually contain an email body and they may contain a file or an attachment uh, attached to the email. Uh, there are also email headers, but we won't discuss them in this part. Uh, so let's take a look at the email body first. An email body can be made up of text or HTML, um, so, or, or you can both of them, you can have both of them in the same email and depending on the settings, one of both will display. 
you could try to insert JavaScript, but on most systems like an, an Outlook or a Gmail, this will not run. However, I've discovered some legacy ticketing software that will actually that was vulnerable to blight cross-site scripting. So I made just a list of public bug bounty programs, sent uh, cross-site scripting and blind cross-site scripting payload to their support uh, desks, and actually three of those uh, actually fired. So. I, I crafted it with the Mailgun API, should you want to try it yourself, but make sure to read all spamming guidelines and, and to ask permission first. Uh, if you do see that they use uh, a custom or a, a legacy uh, support software, for example, <laughs> written in PHP, uh, this is the example that I stumbled upon a couple of years ago, and they're customer service uh, ticketing system would just upload all attachments sent over email to their server as executables. So I would just uh, write the normal support inquiry and then I would attach a PHP file containing a blind cross-site scripting payload and some uh, PHP uh, command, for example, PHP info. Uh, and then my cross-site scripting, like my callback, once the customer service agent opened it, I would receive an email with the actual uh, content or the actual result of whatever I executed. So you can consider it as, as blind RCE, basically. It's not really social engineering because there's a technical vulnerability involved. Um, and and uh, I only found this one, so it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite rare. And then last week, uh, this came out from, from Maxim S. Korbiak, uh, if I pronounce that right, it's not my finding, but it's definitely inter an interesting one. Um, and he noticed that some email parsers would actually, um, for, for uh, certain purposes, uh, email templates would include local files, for example, a logo, and then um, the, before sending it, it would upload as an attachment and it would be rendered uh, as an attachment here, it would be referenced. And then he found that if you would have a HTML injection in an email and just say, okay, I want a, uh, for example, etc password file, then it would just dump it as an attachment and, and try to render it in the, in the email. So uh, whenever you stumble upon an HTML injection in, a, in, a, in an email, always make sure to test that you may get lucky. Uh, so that's it for, for emails themselves, that not really, uh, except for the body and the file, as there's not really too, uh, a lot of tests test over there. Um, and then there's also email mechanisms, for example. Um, email mechanisms, that's basically everything around emails. Those can be features of email uh, clients, but also ways people integrate email into their systems. Um, and obviously, because I was testing these things at a large, large scale, uh, I did have some issues with bug bounty uh, programs complaining about spam uh, from my testing. It's always a, a very thin line. You do want to perform uh, research that nobody did before. You do want to go the extra mile. But the, on the other hand, you do want to uh, keep the noise for the program as low as possible. So I try to stay under the la radar, unfortunately didn't always work out. Um, so whenever you send an email, it either arrives or it bounces. Uh, that's it. And um, yeah. uh, so what, what I was telling you is, is if, you, if you're testing this, please seek permission first, uh, reduce your noise. And, and also, if you can uh, just write what you're doing or use your your hacker one, we are hacker one email addresses that make it easier to track you because you don't want to spam the customer service with all kinds of weird tickets because a lot of other people will be doing that as well. So always make sure to reduce the noise and seek permission first. So I was talking about the anti-spam um, uh, functionalities. Uh, so I try to stay under the radar and by doing so, I, I read this RFC about uh, anti-spam measures. Uh, people have been dealing with, with spam for a long time. And, and this is uh, something from the 90s that I already mentioned, how you could unsubscribe for a list, for example, or, or mention something as spam. You could provide an email header with a URL. But every time I see a URL and uh, in a parameter, uh, it, it basically screams SSRF. So I just put my own um, 
my own host in there in here and a ping back to my machine and then with permission of the bug bounty program i spammed one of their email addresses and i got an immediate ping back so what their system would do is once they've identified me as spam uh, they would just ping my 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 uh, list in subscription email uh, like uh, sorry my, my list in subscription url here uh, to make sure it would stop uh, because in normal situation this would unsubscribe you for the list however in this case it was just ssrf and i could have them redirect to internal resources for example so they did fix that uh, it wasn't a firewall solution so everything went automatically nobody had to press a button this is spam just went automatically so uh, that's i think it's it was a rare uh, scenario but it was nevertheless a very cool one and it also got a pretty decent bug bounty um, so one thing I would advise you when, when testing stuff like this, even if you have permission, is to verify whether the email addresses you want to send emails to uh, exist uh, first. So there's diff different ways to do that. You can use this verify SMTP command and just Google it if you want some more info on that. Or you can uh, to log in and then set the RCPT2. Uh, then uh, you can, in some cases, you will be able to see whether the email address exists or not. If you think this is too complicated, uh, don't cry. There are services to do this uh, for you, and some of them are free. So you really have no excuse. Um, so moving forward, what I always try to do when examining uh, the, the email infrastructure of a company is try to figure out what email addresses exist or what email aliases and what services they, they, they've been linked to and I call this email recon uh, and these are some pretty common ones uh, these are mostly linked to customer support then you have the more ticketing systems and, and these are all kind of, of weird integrations usually uh, custom for the company itself um, so um, uh, this is a very basic example of an active hacker one program uh, i just sent an email to test at, at mybox.com and i got like this half a sentence back and at first glance it doesn't really reveal anything it's just an auto reply but if you would look deeper and open the email headers you would see that it was sent from a specific service so even if the original email doesn't tell you a lot it's always worth to see okay what kind of system was the sent from and, and usually the email headers will or the email original uh, message will, will reveal that to you um, there's also autoresponders most of you will know that from the the classic oh i'm out of office especially now during uh, during the holidays but what i found was that there's two kinds of out of office uh, one you have the 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 one intended internally and this may contain internal email like email addresses or or forms or or whatever and just trying to help your colleagues and in the other one in the other instance you want to um, send a message to people outside of your organization and say okay i'm not available but, but I'll, I'll i'll handle your your request after i'm back so you won't reveal as as much info as you would to your colleagues uh, in this case, for example, it's just an example, it would uh, give away a password. Uh, but how does this work? Uh, so basically, it's, it's kind of simple. You would send an email address and then the, the server would see, OK, is this actually ori originating from the company? Yes or no. And if you're not from the company, you would get the default re response. Um, and then I noticed that if you could also set the reply to header, uh, and, and you could just have it reply back to whoever you want by specifying somebody else as your reply to. You don't really need to own that email address nor has, have access to it. Um, and I, I figured that some of these installations would not check the from email address to see if it belongs to company.com. Um, but no, they, they would check the from email address, I'm sorry, but they, they would still reply to the reply to. So what I would do is I would spoof the email and make it appear uh, to come from company.com. And then once it reaches the server, it would see, okay, this comes from company.com, it's valid. And then it would reply to my own email address, which is an email address of the inbox, obviously, that I can access. So I would be able to exfiltrate the password. This is an actual example I got from uh, one of my bug bounty assessments. 
obviously he heavily redacted. Then there's also email bounces, which are never fun unless you can exploit them, of course. Uh, so a couple of years ago, I found a bug in Google Docs by accident. I just found a link to Google Doc somewhere in a GitHub repository. And I just pressed the request access button. Uh, and basically what would happen whenever you, you would press it is uh, Google itself would send an email from your account to the uh, owner's account. So originating for your email from your email address and it would contain the link to the document, uh, the title, uh, and, and stuff like that. Uh, but in my case, the recipient's inbox was full. And because the email originated from me, uh, it would just bounce back to me because the system was thinking I sent the email. Uh, so the recipient's inbox was full. And I found out about the owner of this document, but also I saw the title of the document and the link in the original forwarded message. This was information I would otherwise not have access to. Obviously, I just got lucky because you can't really expect somebody's inbox uh, being full. You really can't control it. And th this was the moment that I was thinking, OK, how can we make sure a bounce like this happens uh, without having control over the, the status of the uh, recipient's inbox? And then I found out about a, a DMARC policy, which would basically evaluate your SPF or DKIM records, which would basically ensure that an email is authorized and, and is, is, is permitted to be sent from your, your domain. And this is basically a policy that would define what would happen if one of these policies would fail. Uh, it can be rejected, it can be uh, accepted anyways, or be deleted or quarantined or, or you know, whatever. Uh, you, you get to decide what happens here. Uh, so I would set it to always bounce. And in order to, to do that, I would uh, just say, okay, reject everything, make sure to send a report to this email address so I can read it afterwards and then have a do this for 100% of the cases. This is basically the way to make sure all the, the, the third parties or the Googles or whatever, whatever application that tries to forward an email uh, originating from your domain would just send whatever it would try to send back to you. Okay, so this was an example of an email forwarder. Um, and if, in case you're wondering if there's any other uses for it or any other kind of forwarders, except for Google Drive, for example, uh, in the wild that you can exploit, well, there are, and maybe at places you won't expect. Um, one example I came across is ransomware. Um, you, sometimes when you get infected by ransomware, the criminals will leave an email address uh, for you to ask questions to. And what will happen sometimes is that all incoming emails will automatic, automatically be forwarded to another email address, sometimes linked to the attackers themselves. Obviously, you can you can tell what email address this is going to just by sending an email to it, unless it bounces back using our technique. Um, so what I did was I would um, send them an email address from an email domain they that was prohibited to be forwarded. So their forwarded would try to forward it to their original email address. In my case, it was a Gmail address. And I would receive this response back. So like you can see here, the full Gmail address would be revealed in the bounce back. And the, the best thing is that the attackers would not notice anything because they wouldn't even receive my, my email and I would still unmask their original email address. Um, another uh, way forwarders are sometimes used is are in bug bounty uh, platforms. For example, Integrity, HackerOne, BugRoute all use email forwarders to make it more easy for their uh, hackers to sign up somewhere and, and you know just keep better track. And what would happen if you sign up somewhere is this would just um, forward whatever you send to it to your HackerOne or Integrity or BugRoute associated email address. Uh, and I tried this technique with this. So I tried to send an email to my integrity.me email address, so my alias, using a domain that was uh, intended to bounce everything back. And I noticed I could actually reveal everybody's email address just by sending there an email 
at their integrity.me email address and have it bounce back right away. And then one last case I've seen this work is in multi-tenant environments. And that was actually kind of interesting uh, because it resulted in account takeover. So sometimes what will happen is you have this uh, SaaS app and you can add it to your own domain, run it on your domain, but the user management would still be kind of centralized. So you can, for example, you have two users and they have their workspace, but John could invite Alice to their tenant and with the same account, she would have access. Um, so if John would trigger a password reset mail, it would be sent from john.io because the SaaS app has permission to send from john.io uh, and the email would be uh, you know being sent to john.io nicely branded now imagine that john adds alice to their environment and resets the password for alice but just at that moment john adapts the dmark settings and make sure that the, the uh, validation fails and the emails gets bounced, it gets rejected, uh, then john.io will try to send Alice's password reset email that would actually also be valid for her own tenant. So she sends it, but of course we have a strict demark policy and it will bounce back because the SaaS app is not allowed to send from john.io and everything works, but still John ends up receiving uh, Alice's access token. In a, re in a real life scenario, and this is a screenshot I took from an actual bug bounty submission, it looks like this. So you have the email attached, and if you would click this, you would see the full emails with all headers and the password reset link. Um, so this is the whole situation that would occur and actually, you know, would allow John to get, to reset Alice's password and thus access her own uh, workspace resulting in full account takeover without user interaction. I found multiple of these, so it's always very interesting to see if you have this kind of setup, whether you can bounce other people's uh, password reset tokens. Uh, that would be a horrible uh, thing. So I think we covered it all for today. Uh, thank you for attending this session. I look forward to your feedback. And I also look forward to seeing more people doing uh, research on emails and email addresses in, in general. Thank you.